everyone. Thanks for listening to the Italian American Entertainment Podcast. I'm your host, Vince Shirelli, and today we have Corey Pesaturo on the show. And uh, Corey, also known as CPEZ, is uh, mm-hmm. one of uh, only four accordionists to win uh, world championships on both acoustic and digital accordion, has performed at the White House multiple times, has given uh, the only accordion TED Talk, and is a visionary on how the accordion should be used and played in modern music, and much more about him, but uh, we'll get into that in this interview. So welcome, Corey. How are you today? Hello, Vince. How are you? Ciao, ciao, ciao. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for uh, talking with me today and uh, jumping on last minute. Just talked to you yesterday, so thanks for doing this. <laughs> ah, I'm an improviser, as you'll see, so <laughs> yeah, this is quite normal for me. <laughs> that's good. I am too, so that's perfect. So uh, the basis of this site and this podcast is to feature Italian-Americans in the entertainment industry. So um, there's a lot of great websites about Italian-Americans, but... Uh, I didn't see one that was just dedicated to us in music or actors or writers or things like that, just in entertainment. So um, here we are. You're a musician, <laughs> great musician. <laughs> I'm a musician, so this should be and an I, interesting, interesting interview. So well, a very, very proud Italian American. I certainly would uh, wouldn't want to be anything else but Italian. So. <laughs> That's right. Me too. <laughs> so uh, to start with, uh, since this is about being Italian. Where are you located now, but where do you trace your ancestry back to in Italy? So I am in the very Italian state of Rhode Island, uh, which at one point had the highest percentage of Italians, um, was 51% for, for a long time. It's, it's fallen off since, and I think Connecticut has taken over as the uh, highest percentage of Italians. Um, all family history was here, um, and pretty much all of, I'm fully Italian, and pretty much all of my great-grandparents uh, met here or, or, and, or uh, were brought here in about 1910, 1915, all in that era. And uh, they pretty much, all, all my blood comes from central Italy, not north, south, all over. It's pretty much all central. It's a mix of L'Aquila, Sulmona, uh, Arch, which is a little tiny town about an hour south of Rome. Um, and Rome itself, actually. So it's kind of that circle in, in central Italy, which I guess is how I get the, the nose. But, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's I have no blood coming from there that I know of. I'm all Sicilian, so I'm south. Ah, <laughs> Sicilian. I see. I see. Yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. And I actually just got my DNA tested, which was very interesting. Uh, was it what you thought? Uh, yes, because Sicilians are a mix of everything, but yes, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, 70% Italian, of course, but uh, Southern Italian, but the, the, re- the rest of it was uh, Western, Asian, Middle Eastern, which is, you would expect yep. for Sicily, you would expect, but yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't think it would be in the 20 something percent. That was the only shocking part to me that it was that I, high, I, but. I actually just watched the other day uh, a Rick Steves episode on, on Sicily, and when he goes through the markets and the people are just screaming their heads off at the yeah. markets. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting over there. <laughs> I, well, it's like my whole family upbringing, you know. Oh, yeah. think, are you guys screaming at each other? Why are you so mad at each other? No, we're just talking. That's, that's, we're Italian. That's how it is. <laughs> but uh, so anyways, uh, you have uh, accomplished a lot. How, how old are you, by the way? We've got to be about the same age. Oh God! Asking a, mus- asking a musician <laughs> well, his age is like asking guys, a girl so, his age. <laughs> well, <laughs> you got to be twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, something like that. Yes, yes. Right, and yeah. and I'm, been I'm playing for for twenty years, uh, which is crazy to think about. I've been playing for twenty years. I feel like I just, you know. Oh, I remember when I started accordion. I remember the room I was in, the first lesson I had. And it's like I've been playing twenty years. Oh, yeah, God. that's. It's crazy. I started, uh, my mm-hmm. first instrument was actually the, what I played with you. We played together last year with Aaron, which was just a last minute jump on the stage. No one uh, oh, we whenever it's with Aaron, it's always a last minute. You know, get that the was, box, get the box. That was, I am not a drummer by any means, uh, but my first instrument was drums when I was two, singing on the drums. And then I realized when I was 12, it's hard to sing playing the drums. So I played the guitar, but uh, very few <laughs> people do that. Yes. Yes. So, uh, but. How did you get into the accordion, and what age was it? So, um, so I'll go, it's because of my dad, but I'll go back. My dad uh, started playing the accordion when Dick and Tino became famous, back when the accordion was the most popular instrument in the country. And it was kind of the tail end of that. Uh, and then he quit when it was no longer popular. And if you couldn't get a date playing accordion, you certainly stopped playing accordion. And, and the accordion died from the most popular instrument to a laughingstock in just a matter of a couple of years. 
Uh, then he took it out when I was nine and started playing again and asked me, do you want to play accordion? Now, in you know, my family, it's like you always want to try to make your parents proud. You want to disobey them. He said, okay, my parent, my dad wants me to play accordion. Okay, I'll play accordion. I didn't want to do it. Um, and even we found out very early on that I had a musical talent and, and just had, I was flying past everybody else in the studio. But even when I became national champion at 15, I still didn't love to do it. I just always was extremely competitive and I couldn't compete in sports. I was never good at sports. I loved watching them, loved talking about them as I still do. But um, actually playing them, I was never good at. But this was something I could compete at. Um, and it wasn't really until I found jazz at say 17 that I started realizing, ooh, you know, I really love this thing. Um, but I certainly started off playing all Italian music because that's what I'd heard my dad playing. And so all my first gigs and, and all the first tunes I learned were Femina and all the stuff I do with Aaron, actually, you know, Alvila right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and all these old classic uh, Italian tunes. Uh, I tried to always stay away from Aldi Law. <laughs> I'm on my life's mission to teach Italian Americans that that's not a real Italian song. Yeah. Uh, and teach them tunes like Reginella or things like that. There you go. But um, so that was kind of how it started. I wanted to make my, my dad happy. Okay, he wants me to play accordion. I'll, I'll play accordion. And then I realized, oh, I have a talent for this. Well, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll do this. And I, I always wanted to have... It was always different and unique in different ways. So I was like, oh, a musician life. That sounds good. I think I'll do this. So, but I still didn't love to play accordion. Uh, that, that, that took, took till later. Uh, now, of course, it's like I'm trying to make the accordion cool again <laughs> because it's just the most amazing instrument. And sadly, in this country and in Italy, I don't think people realize in Italy it's the same as America. If you go to, you know, an event and you meet somebody, I play accordion, like, oh, that's interesting. You think in Italy, it's all oh, they think it's cool. No, it's the same thing. Um, people there will say, oh, my, my grandparents play accordion. It's not, it's the same as America. It's kind of seen as, oh, yeah, that's what the, the older folks did. France, it's still normal. Scandinavia, it's still normal. But in Italy, it's, it's kind of like America. It's, it's fallen off as a, as a folk thing. It's interesting. Um, you know, growing up, in my, you know, uh, I'm whatever, first generation, so I, I don't know. My mom was still born there, and I'm 100%. So, I mean, my grandparents all didn't speak English very well. So I grew up with my grandparents uh, playing all that type of music, Dick Contino stuff and, and the accordion. So I grew up with the, you know, Carnival of Venice was like my grandfather's favorite song. <laughs> yes. All day long listening to Carnival of Venice. But my, my grandfather, who I get the musical gene after, did not play accordion, but my great grandfather did, but I never knew him. So no one in my family really played the accordion. So I unfortunately also grew up as one of those people thinking the accordion was kind of the old great grandfather's <laughs> instrument, which is unfortunate. Right. It's unfortunate that that's happened because to be honest, nowadays, I wish I knew how to play the accordion. I actually bought my son, he's four, I bought him a little tiny accordion. He likes <laughs> messing around with it. But uh, why do you think that happened? Why? Uh, I mean, I'm, well, sure, I'm sure that's a huge conversation, but I mean... Well, it, it is. And I mean, I've, I've done a lot of research on it, but the, the short answer is when you... The accordion, you know, Dickentino goes on um, the, okay, now I'm forgetting, the Horace Height Show, and becomes famous in 1949 into 1950. He's on the Ed Sullivan Show constantly through the early 50s, and the accordion explodes, and the accordion becomes the biggest export of Italy, hmm. of any item at that time, and most of them were coming to America uh, because of the fame that it had. <laughs> but then when you get into the 60s, everyone says, well, rock and roll, you know, came in and that became popular and, and the accordion kind of died with it. But it's far more than that. It's the fact that the 60s in America was, was the first generation where kids decided they weren't going to listen to their parents. They were going to rebel against their parents, um, you know, more so than any previous generation. And what did their parents do? What did their parents want them to do? It's the accordion. Right. And what was the rebellion? Rock and roll, guitar, drums. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the accordion fell from grace so viciously. And I know people that owned music stores back in the day, and they said within a year, it was, it was drastic how everyone wanted to play accordion, no one wanted to play accordion. It happened so quickly. Um, and then and that kind of went with it, and it had that stigma of the old thing. And, and what helped that stigma of being the old person instrument was Lawrence Welk show. They, people would say, Lawrence Welk killed the accordion. No, 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 it didn't. But it, it helped keep that image of the accordion is an old person instrument, and I'm not going to go near that, through the 60s, through the 70s, through the 80s. Um, but now there's 
a benefit in the fact that it's been dead for so long that people have forgotten the negative stereotype behind it. And, and now kids don't think of it positively, but they don't think of it with a negative term as well. They kind of see it as, oh, that's, um, oh, what is, that's, uh, that's kind of unique. So they come at it with an intrigue now, where 10, 15 years ago it was like, <laughs> accordion. Huh? So it's coming out of that, but it's taken far longer than I would have thought. Because still, the people that run the world, the people that run the in entertainment industry, run America's Got Talent, run anything you can think of, they're all of that age group. Or it was too close to the generation that played accordion, and they still think of the accordion as completely unmarketable, would never be able to make this, you know, sell this to young people, make them think it's cool. And, and that's why I'm always playing electronic stuff on it, because that would possibly help that. <laughs> and say, wait a minute, you right. can play all this pop music on the accordion? I'm like, yeah. The electric accordion really shows why the acoustic accordion is, is so amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, so on the, just because I'm so, you know, dumb to this about the accordion, I'm a musician, but I really know nothing about the accordion. But so the digital, I'm assuming you have to plug it into some type of patches to make it sound, get all the different sounds, right? Or is yeah, it all, it's not, I'm assuming it's not all internal in the accordion. Yes. Oh, no, no, oh. no. This is, oh, is uh, another amazing thing uh, with the accordion history is that the uh, digital accordions, it's all on board. I mean, I'm not really? attached to anything. I can walk around and play DJ stuff. And then I can oh, okay. switch That's it around and play, you know, uh, Avocadilla and then go back and, <laughs> and play a Lady Gaga song. Okay. So, um, no, it's all, it's all on board. That's and, interesting. And, and even that one was actually built in Italy, even though... Um, you know, the one I play was from, from Roland, which is in Japan, but they, the designers were all in Italy. And most all accordions that exist on this planet today were all made in one town in Italy, Castel Pidardo, which is near Ancona uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and, and really, accordion history has sprung from Italy for the past mm, 140 years or so, because it was originally kind of designed in China, um, as an organetto, an idea to try to, like, how do we have an organ that can fit in our pocket? That right, was the idea, right. which it still kind of is, uh, reeds that you play. So then it moved to Germany, and it developed more, and then when it got to Italy, that's when it sprung into looking like the way we see it today. But uh, funny enough, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, who wasn't already the greatest human being to ever live, <laughs> he designed the first accordion. Oh, and there are, two, there are two groups of people that have actually built his drawing. And it's very similar to the accordion we play today versus the first uh, iterations of the accordion. I mean, the, I don't know how he, it had like a keyboard. It just had pipes on the top because he had to have the, the, the air go somewhere uh, hmm. for the reeds. And it had bellows that you pulled. Interesting. <laughs> so another thing Leonardo da Vinci did. But yeah, accordion history is pretty much all in Italy. All the names, Pagini, Scandali, Borsini, they're all from Castel Pidardo in Italy. That's cool. So... Um... You know, the big name, of course, is Dick Contino, the mainstream that most people know. Um, yep. But is there, other than him, and maybe it is him, is there an Italian-American accordion player or an Italian accordion player that really influenced you outside of your family that made you get into it? Mm, no, I mean, the only other person that was somewhat famous during that time was Tony Labello, who was another really good friend of mine like Dick's was. But Tony died, uh, what, same year that, that Dick died, three years really? ago. Um, and he, he was a phenomenal accordion player, fully Italian. Um, but the only other one to know about accordion history was Guido Dero. And Guido Dero, I knew his son really well. He just died terribly last year. Because um, he was born in, what, 1886, but he didn't have his son until 1938. So he, <laughs> he survived much longer. Wow. So I got to know a lot about Guido, even though he was born 135 <laughs> years ago. Um, but Guido brought the uh, piano accordion to America in 1909 at the uh, Alaskan. They had this big Alaskan fair uh, then kind of celebrating Alaska at that point in, in Seattle. And he went to Seattle and started his career there. And, and the Italians thought, I know how we can promote accordion in America. This is easy. Americans don't know accordions, but they know pianos. You know, all rich families had pianos in their house. Let's put a piano on the right side and let's sell it to America. And that's what became of America, that we play piano accordion, as Italy does uh, today. Every country is different in how that goes. It's very funny. It's a border-to-border -border instrument, which kinds of accordion each country plays. So he brought piano accordion to America then, and it spread like wildfire, and he was incredibly famous by the mid-teens, through the teens, uh, and even married Mae West, 
oh, wow. was about you know as as big as you got for for which girl you dated uh, at that time. And it was before she became really famous. He made her get famous because she was just an opening act of his for a couple of years on the vaudeville scene, and and he helped her get the amazing fame that she got a little later. Um, but that, that was how big he was for, for a couple of decades. Uh, and then the accordion died off a little bit, but it was still normal to play. And then Dick and Tino in 1949 explodes again. And Dick and Tino took lessons from Guido at times. So there's a strong connection there of accordion history, all Italian-Americans, from Guido Dero to Dick and Tino uh, wow. and, and later on. Yeah, so Dick uh, died, what was it, three years ago, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so it was... Three years ago was 17, yeah, so 2015, I played with Dick at Milwaukee Fest, and that was great. To he, get was to... a, he was a star there. I think he played there 34 <laughs> times. Yes, it, it was, was like... like almost every year he was there, and uh, I didn't yeah, know... Yeah, this when... fan <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know until we got there that we were going to be on the same stage with him, and that was very cool. His, I think it was his brother or brother-in-law was there. Uh, he was a really cool guy, and I was amazed, you know... Uh, be him in his 80s, it had to have been at that time, you know, putting that giant <laughs> accordion on him. And he looked so, you know, it was just like he just went out there and held it. And it was amazing to watch him. He still had it it's still towards the he, end. He did. As soon as, you know, the only time at the end, he, he had a little bit of trouble picking up the accordion. Right. Yeah. It but was, once you got it on him, it was exactly. you know, still the muscles and exactly. you know, the whole thing. And yeah. No. So it was it was great getting to at least meet him and talk to him for a while uh, there at the end. But uh, so is there really any of the i hate saying it but the old timers that are left or are they unfortunately all um so i mean luckily a lot of the at least uh i'd say third generation guys were still fully around when i was starting out the first generation is like guido dero his brother right. pietro dero and then the second generation are, are guys named uh, pietro frasini um, and, and that kind of leads into third generation of, of charlie nunzio charlie mignanti all the guys that ended up uh, making the accordion organizations that still exist today. And uh, so there's, there's that kind of lineage. But no, they are all gone. Because then there's the gap when nobody played accordion. And we're at right. that point where the very few people that played in that gap are you know, still playing and, and still doing fine. But the, the real golden era of accordion, those guys, uh, Tony Lovello, Dick and Tino, uh, the, those with Nunzio that died, I don't know, 10 years ago. So that, that, that was... That was it. That's the end of it. But I, I tried to do my best of finding all these people, getting to know them, become friends with them, and, and learn everything I could from them. Right. And pretty much they're all Italian. It's yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Well, do you know, much all. it might be rare for you to know them, but maybe not, because it's a small circle of you guys. But here in Rockford, where I live, uh, is Alangi, Mike Alangi. He is <laughs> the most underrated jazz accordion player in the world. All so, time. Wow, so you know him. I, that's amazing. Oh, oh, do I know him? Watch <laughs> watch this. I did not plan this. I did not think you were about to say Michael Longi. Um, wow, look at that. I've got a CD right here. So, uh, Be Before COVID, I saw him at the grocery store, and I stopped and talked to him for a while. He So crazy how small the world is, but his father, Vince Longi, was in my grandfather's band for years. Um, and what did he play? So Vince, I believe, kind of was a played everything type of guy, type of musician. Um, mm -hmm. But I think he used to play either saxophone or clarinet, uh, some type of wind instrument uh, with my grandfather. But I think he played guitar mm -hmm. and a bunch of others and mandolin and stuff like that. Um, right, right. There's recordings because my grandfather did a lot of recordings. I think there's one with Mike on accordion and his dad probably on mandolin somewhere uh, with my grandfather. But yeah, Mike... Uh, He's one of the last ones probably here in Rockford going, and he still plays. Um, I've seen him once in a while. He played a festival a couple of years ago here, so he's a great guy. I didn't know. It's weird. I just He just popped into my head. I didn't know you knew him. <laughs> he, I know, honestly, I think he's the most underrated jazz accordion player in the world. The world. Um, he's, his, his lines um, are just bleeping perfect. <laughs> it's, it's like if you want to study how to play jazz perfectly, not that you could ever play something so improvised perfectly, but he's as close as you get uh, hmm. on the way he plays. And uh, I've certainly learned things from him. And he's a wonderfully nice guy. Yeah. Um, I talked to him, I don't know, I just talked to him about two weeks ago or something, because me and, and my jazz accordion hero, Eddie Montero, 
um, we, we were going over his, that CD. That's why I have the CD right here. There was some wow. lines we were going over, and he was transcribing Michael's solos, which is funny because because Eddie's you know a legend. And he's and he's like transcribing solos of Michael's because he loves them so much. And we're talking about you know great Michael is. So it's wow. great that you that you mentioned him. Yes, and, and another Italian. And hopefully I'll see him uh, a week and a half from now when I head uh, over to Chicago. Oh, cool. What's going on in Chicago? You playing? I'm playing the look at this. The, the first real gig I've had I since was the say. quarantine <laughs> was the Italian Club of Chicago. Um, and we are going to have three concerts outside, only 30 people each. So instead of one concert for 100, we're doing three concerts for 30. Uh, and it will be outside. Um, but yeah, it took the Italian Club of Chicago to get me my first gig uh, since COVID started. <laughs> yeah, it's been a tough year. We'll get into that here in a little bit. But. Uh... So, you know, what I like about about you and I've been watching some of your videos the past couple of days and, you know, when I talked to Aaron, your name came back up in my head. And so I started watching and the, someone put a line somewhere um, that it's uh, the way you're trying to revolutionize it is it's like not your known news or not your grandfather's accordion, um, which is so weird because the tagline that I'm using for my band to try to change the perception of Italian music with my band is we're not your nonnas Italian music. We're so, not your nonnas. <laughs> <laughs> because what I've discovered is when you say, what type of music do you play? Oh, we play Italian mm-hmm. music. It's immediate Pavarotti, oh, opera, Lord. or or that's Amore and Volare. <laughs> it's, yeah. There's kind of like a stigma that there's only, but it's not. I mean, there's so much Italian music. So that's why there's I tried so to much. say not your known as Italian music. But it's interesting, you know, you're trying to revolutionize it a little, and make it a little more modern. So what, what made you decide, what was the day that it was either you got to the point where it's, I don't like how the perception is, or I'm going to be the one that makes the difference. What made you wake up one day and say, I want to revolutionize it? Oh, I mean, that was very early on. I mean, I'm, I'm very much you know, a, a fan of meritocracies and hierarchies. And I, I think without those, what's the point of living on the planet? Um, and Italians are very good at in, instilling that. But you know, the, when I started winning competitions and really doing well what I did. And I, I wasn't gaining any popularity at school. I was still oh, yeah, the accordion player. And I'm like, if I was half as good at guitar, I would, right. you know, I, I'd, I'd, just, I'd be the most popular kid at school. Right. But because it's accordion. And that, and that fueled me. Instead of, you know, getting depressed, going, <laughs> I said, I'm going to get so damn good. They can't, they can't, you know, not see me. So, and that continued, and that continued. Then I won a national championship, couldn't get any news, couldn't get any press. But if someone, you know, ate a hot dog in 10 seconds, they'd be on the national news. <laughs> so that continued. And all of the failures, you know, to this point of not getting famous have fueled me to achieve more. And then I went and won a one world championship. I won another one, then I won another one. Then I won on, a, you know, I won an acoustic accordion. And no one had ever done that, of winning all those three championships. And that wasn't enough. I couldn't get any press. So then I went and did the Guinness World Record. I came back home, and I got some Boston Globe and things like that, but still couldn't get national press. I remember the day after I came back from the Guinness World Record and was having trouble getting any media, someone in Hartford, Connecticut, had built the biggest pizza of all time, and they were on <laughs> national news. I'm like, biggest pizza, national news. Guinness World Record with an accordion who's already a world champion. For the United States, absolutely nothing. So, um, you know, it, it, but it started early on that I noticed that, you know, this is not the case. But the, the thing is, I, I'm never one to attack the, the stereotyper. I, I think it's my job as the stereotypee uh, whose job is to change the image of the accordion. I can't ask billions of millions of people. Uh, you know, stop thinking the accordion only plays that Samori with an old guy sitting down. It's my job to project this is what it can do take a moment and just listen to me for just five seconds and then you will change your mind and every time i play there's at least one person that says i didn't know i liked accordion until i heard you play and and you know it's a slow process but that's that's kind of the 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 charm of it but that's that was always my motivation i knew early on that that was even before i really loved the accordion i just hated the fact that i knew it was capable of all these things and people just they just laugh at it. They just didn't care. And then someone would get on gu- guitar and play like two notes, you know, and it'd be like, oh, yeah, rock on. It's like, I can do that asleep. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, can you play Freebird? I can, I can play Freebird in any key you want 
and improvise far better than that while playing the freebird solo and have a bass line at the same time. What do you, I mean, please. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's sad, but you can't do it by force. You just have to show by example, look at what the accordion could do. So um, are, you, are you teaching at all, or are you seeing some of the younger kids getting into this? I try to stay in touch with all the young accordion players around the world. And I have eyes in the field all around the world. So, if, I mean, if someone so much as touches an accordion that's below the age of 30, I'll be notified of it. <laughs> and I'll try to get in touch with them and, um, you know, and, and, and give them any advice I can. And, uh, you know, today, younger people, like, someone see that as creepy. And it's like, wow, well, who's this person? It's the, you know, but some people smartly are like, wait a minute. This, this guy, he's, he's contacted me. Yeah, because the accordion world's so small. I, can, I have the time to stay in touch with all these young players around the world. Um, just, just last night, there's a, one from Russia, this, this fantastic player no one's ever heard of, um, just started up an Instagram page, and they play fantastic. They play classical music, Scarlatti and Bach and everything. And so I was talking to them last night, you know, and, and said, you know, do you improvise? No, let me help you, you know, try to get on the path of improvisation. Because um, especially in Europe and Russia, they, they play phenomenally well, but they don't improvise. And they, or they don't play jazz, especially, and they try to play it. And it's like anything. I can practice Balkan music all my life. I'm never going to play it perfect ever. <laughs> you have to be right. born there. Same with jazz. People in Europe, a lot of times, they play jazz. It's just there's something missing in the pocket of their playing. You've got you to play with jazz musicians in America. So, um, but, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's such a small world. That's the one benefit is I can stay connected with the whole thing. If you were a guitar player trying to stay in touch with every guitar player, you right, do yeah. 100% impossible, but it's possible with the accordion. Right. So other than the accordion, just for some of the listeners out there that might think, um, of course, it is your whole world, but is there other hobbies? A whole new world. <laughs> is, uh, do you have another big hobby or something you like to do other than the accordion? No, I don't really. No, I don't, no. no I, I, I don't know if that was a setup question. No, I, I have too many hobbies. Uh, if okay. you would like one, I'd like to sell them. I wish you could sell <laughs> hobbies for like $100,000. That'd be great. I have way too many hobbies. I mean, uh, accordion would probably be fourth on my list of time spent in my life. Huh. Um, I, I'm a huge weather guy, specifically hurricanes and snowstorms. I'm a big <laughs> snow guy. Um, I'm big time into motorsports. I can talk motorsports all day, every day, uh, the history of it, everything else. Uh, you could do a podcast on how correct was Ford versus Ferrari. You know, where were they wrong? Where were they right? <laughs> um, all sports. Being in Boston, our religion is sports in right. Boston. Um, so, yes, I'm still hurt by the Bruins losing. <laughs> but I knew it was coming. Um, you know, is, is, what else? Uh, well, I've been able to play some golf this year, which I haven't been able to do in a very long time because when do I have time? But it's like, oh, quarantine. The only one of the few things you could do, get back to golf. I used to do that with my grandfather a lot. That's cool. um, but there's I, no there's there's so many hobbies statistics anything statistics related tall buildings always <laughs> always been intrigued by that um, that's cool yeah I, I have I have too many hobbies. video games always been huge into video games and I think there's a connection there between you know uh, instead right. of ear brain fingers it's eyes brain fingers and I right. think there's some connection between when I'm improvising at a high speed directing my fingers in an exact order. I think there's something the same that could be said about video games. Um, not that parents want me to say that. How do you get better at music? Play video games. I don't think they want to hear that. But <laughs> I think I could do some kind of a, a, a connection between the two. But yes, too many hobbies. Too All many right. hobbies. So a question that just popped into my head, um, because you know I am not the, all of us will say we're not the greatest musician in the world, and me for sure. I mean, If, I if you aren't Art Tatum, you're not there yet. That's what yeah, I said. <laughs> I, so you know, I, when I was a sophomore in high school, I took AP music theory. And mm. still to this day, I took all the AP classes, the hardest stuff. Music theory was the hardest AP class I ever took. And really? Okay. It was. And uh, it actually wasn't AP, but most people don't know what IB is. <laughs> I was in the international baccalaureate. It was like a step above AP. And, oh, wow. It was a step yeah. above AP. So IB music theory, very, very difficult. And But I learned a lot, and I got really into music theory for a few years. And then I just kind of let it go, and you know, I don't remember a lot of it anymore. But um, improvising is a big thing with, I think every Italian musician because you grew up in the backyard with the family at the barbecues and stuff and you're just making stuff up and playing the old music. But what, uh, when I talk to musicians, you know, I always see two types. Maybe I'm wrong. It's the, 
the readers that they can't play unless something's written out. If you say, mm-hmm. oh, play this song with me, it's just they panic and they say, I, don't, I can't play it. Or, you know, there's their improvisers, which I, I've seen you play. I played with you. And, you know, Aaron just says, play this and whatever, B flat. And, you know, you just do it. He changes key in the middle of difficult songs <laughs> right. in the middle right. of the song. And I'm, I'm just expected to do it. But I see, I, I, you know, I like that because yeah, it actually no. uses, uses my skill uh, where a lot of times you play gigs where it's, you're just using 5% of your skill. Exactly. Um, so when you're doing that, just like when I'm doing that, you know, Frank and I, my guitarist, we'll look at each other and we'll just, we'll, we'll hear a song on the radio on the way to a gig and we'll, we'll just mess around and play it. When you're doing that, mm-hmm. are you thinking about playing or are you thinking about something else because when i'm doing it my mind is elsewhere and i'm just it's all muscle memory i'm just letting it go i've I've always found it interesting because Mm -hmm. if i start thinking or especially with lyrics because i'm the singer and guitar player Mm -hmm. if i actually try to think about what i'm doing during a gig i'll mess up (laughs) if i try to think about what the next word is well see my my hands my hands freak out Mm -hmm. and i lose it all it's like i have to be in a different zone and i don't know i've seen you play so fast are you actually thinking about it or is it just all let it roll and see what happens so that kind of mentality, I would think you are much more of a reader if you, if you think about things and worry about screwing up if you think about them. I would think you're much more of a reader and not an improviser. And I'm really not. I'm not a good reader. Hmm. Or, or more structured and you play things in the same way every time, should I say. Maybe. Maybe that. Be- because um, that's the only time I worry <clears throat> when I have to play something exactly uh, as written. When I used to play competitions of written music, I would looking at the, you know look at the floor, look at the designs on the floor. Look at, look at that design, and then the, the line goes over here. And I couldn't really think about what I was playing, or I would mess up. When I'm improvising, I'm 110 percent locked into what I'm playing for sure, um, and I'm always thinking about the chord changes. To me, it's it's by far the most important aspect of music. By far is the chord changes. When I'm listening to uh, Mozart, or I'm listening to Vivaldi, or I'm listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I'm listening to. I'm judging you by the chord changes, which is why most music the past 70 years doesn't interest me at all because the chord changes are just so dumb. Uh, right. and, and it wasn't before. It, you know, people get fixated on the melody, but the, the melody, uh, the, the melody doesn't do anything unless it has the vehicle of the good chord changes. Uh, that's that's what drives it. And you can have you know one note samba. Great tune. Why? Great chord changes. Right. So it's, um, you know, it goes down to that. So I'm always thinking of chords. And, and always, if you know what the chord changes are, you'll never screw up. You don't have to know. You don't know the lyrics. You don't know the melody. You don't know anything. To the point where I can play parties and people say, do you know this tune? And what I do is I'll just play the chord changes and they all start singing the melody and they think right. I'm playing the tune when I don't know the tune. If you right. give them the chord changes, they'll think you're playing the tune. Right. So, um, but yeah, no, you're right. And then the idea of, you know, readers and non-readers. And, and the thing is, you know, today's world is so much of, you know, anybody can do anything if you put your mind. It's all BS. I'm sorry. It's completely, completely false uh, with, with anything. If I wanted to play basketball, I'm, I'm you know, 5'8". I ain't playing basketball. <laughs> no matter if I practice 24 hours a day. And it's the same with music. There's different levels of talents that you are born with. And I, there's some people I could teach all day improvisation. They just won't be able to do it. Right. And the same way that I don't have perfect pitch. So I've spent many years trying to develop really, 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 really good um, relative pitch, we call it. But if I was born a perfect pitch, all that time, years, could have been spent doing something else because you're just born, you know what every note is. And when someone plays, they'll go, oh, that was F sharp, E flat, D, and they go through every note. I can't, (laughs) I can guess, I can take a really good educated guess, but I can't do that. There's certain things we are born with that that just uh, give us an idea of, you know, of, of that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, you can always get better, but you're never going to be able to do what other people can do without even thinking about it. I don't know why I can, you know, improvise at a thousand notes a minute and, and do it somewhat comfortably um, and, and think about what I'm doing and my fingers will direct the rest. But, you know, it's, it, it comes from both. You have to have the knowledge. You have to have the practice yeah. um, for sure. You, you're not just going to do it by talent. It needs the work ethic. But there are some things you just have to be born with uh, yeah. to, to, be able, to be able to do that. Yeah. So since this is about Italian-American entertainment, um, yeah. out, outside of what you're doing, you know, uh, for the accordion, um, what is your hope for Italian-American entertainment in general? Um, and do you have a good feeling 
that since we're about the same age, that there's others like me and you out there that are going to keep the Italian American entertainment and music going. I'm honestly petrified, to be totally honest with you. Um, in the fact of all these Italian festivals I've played around the country, there is, you know, very few young people performing. And at the same time, you know, because these things just become so family oriented, you get to know the heads of each festival. And there, you know, I'm always saying, oh, you know, I could try to find you some young people. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. If you have any young people doing Italian music, please, please, please. And it's, I can barely find it. And, and I've told people, I've told many young people I, that, that are Italian, that are in music. I said, if you start learning real, the old Italian music and, and put your own spin on it and create it an act, I can help you get huge gigs all around the country. Yeah. So they're, they're dying. These Italian festivals are dying for young musicians that are Italian, that are playing Italian-American music and Italian music. And, and, this, and then you also see with Italian festivals, from a different perspective, the marketing aspect of, well, let's have the festival be half Italian music, but half non-Italian music, just popular stuff that'll get the people in. You know, we'll bring them in. Even at Milwaukee the other year, they had KC and the Sunshine Band. Yeah. Okay, well, that'll bring people in, and then hopefully they'll stay with the Italian music, and they'll come with the Italian music and get to like it. We, it's like it can't exist on its own. So there's both those problems of the, the festivals themselves having other stuff to bring people in, but also there's, there's just very few. I'm one of the only young people I see at all these, all these Italian festivals, and singers I've brought in to Festa Italiana and other festivals, a lot of times not Italian. They just love right. Italian music, and, which, is, which is fine. As long as you love Italian music, that's more important than if you are Italian and you don't, you don't know anything. Right. So it's like I'm very accepted in the Jewish community because I know well over 100 <laughs> klezmer tunes and can play right. hours and hours and hours of klezmer music, even though I'm not Jewish. They love having me there because I know more about the Jewish music than a lot of Jews do. So it's the same thing. If you, if you sing it and, and you're, you're going to sing uh, Tufan and Kanyere or something, please, come Come, come in, let's do it, um, yeah. and we'll make it. You know, we'll make a joke about it. So no, it, it's it's a bit scary, um, and it's just I think because you have to look at when did those immigrants come to America. Every ethnicity comes at a different time, and we're a solid hundred years removed from when that real influx of Italians came here. And now we've been so Americanized. I I do worry how much is left, uh, and especially since you know my success I think is completely predicated on the fact that my parents refused to have me grow up in a participation trophy type of society. Same and I think here. Italians are very good at, you know, the, the old-fashioned thing where if you come home beat up from school, they don't call the principal or call right, the teachers. Yeah. They beat you up for getting beat up <laughs> so that you go and beat the crap out of that person and then don't get beat up again. Yeah. And, and, but it's still that, you know, we're not going to give you a participation trophy kind of a vibe. And, right. and, and that creates success. And the younger generation, our generation, especially the younger ones, are so viciously against that idea and, and just thinks we need to live in a world where everybody succeeds, and that's not reality. Yeah. Uh, we need to have things be very difficult because then the true greatness comes through and the, the people that should succeed will usually succeed, and they'll be tougher for it and stronger for it. In the same way, you never see Italians ever complain about anything. There's only two things now in my whole life I've seen Italians complain about. Jersey Shore, which they should have, and the statues of Columbus recently coming in. Right. Other than that, we... You know, Dominic the donkey, that could be considered incredibly racist. We laugh at it. Say, oh, right. I love that tune. We just laugh at it because we're, we're tough. We're not going to get offended by something like that. Yeah, no. You, know, you have to really push the limits for us to be like, okay, hold on. Yeah. That's too far. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and I, I hope that that culture is still there because, again, I, I wouldn't have had the success I've had of all these records and championships and you know, if I didn't have an upbringing where my dad, I think, has told me I did a good job three times in my life, you know, still same. to this day. <laughs> so the that same. makes you, it, it, because it does two things. Either it makes you fight more for what, what you're trying to go for, or you quit, but it means you didn't love it that much. So you should go into something else. Yeah. You know, it, 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 those are the only two options, and they're both great options. Either quit because you didn't have the drive for it, or you did have the drive for it, and you're going to keep striving and you'll create higher and, and strive for greatness. Um, so I, I hope that Italian culture, that tough love, doesn't, doesn't go away, but I, yeah. I'm quite worried it, it is. Yeah, no, I have a four-year-old now, and uh, I'm trying to instill some of that. <laughs> it's hard because, you know, times have changed and, you know, technology and everything and iPads. People, and are, be, yeah, people are being grown up by their phones. <laughs> yeah, uh, so and, it's and tough, but, you know, uh, you know, 
my parents are both 100% Italian. My grandmothers are still around, which is great. So he's getting some of that culture. And it's just unfortunate. You know, I've played most of the Italian festivals in the country, and I'm sure you have too. And some of them are great and keep to the traditions. And unfortunately, some are, Mm -hmm. like you said, it's cover bands and country music. And um, it's it's a little, I I get it and I don't get it. (laughs) <laughs> on, on, it's it's hard um you know i i th- i said this to ron onesti in our last interview that uh, when someone goes to a mexican restaurant they don't order a hamburger so i think that's how people feel when they go to an italian festival or a polish festival or a german festival they want to feel that way for a day or a weekend and i think some of the festivals are actually hurting themselves by trying to appeal to the masses so it's it's unfortunate, but uh, you know I started the Italian festivals when I was twenty, so it's been ten years now, um, and I've seen some come and go, which is unfortunate. But I I'm the same way. I don't. I was the youngest that I knew of um, at the time playing the festivals. I don't see really anyone younger than us, which is which is sad. And I I hope I hope it happens. But <laughs> you know I just turned thirty and I'm panicking that I'm getting old. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's odd, but uh, so other than the Italian festivals being canceled this year, and I know you play a lot of them, what what's on the horizon for you playing out other than the Chicago gig you got coming up? Um, I, uh, just a couple of virtual events that we've turned from real events to virtual events. I mean, very few. I mean, after Chicago, I have no official um gigs there are potentials of festivals canceled this year that have dates for next year right. but it's completely all being set yeah. by when you know because you need multiple things to happen and people i don't think realize how long musicians are going to be out of work because yeah there are restaurant gigs in there but i did those when i was 12 and 13 i'm not doing that now I'm, i will wait for the, the big gigs to come back yeah um yeah i did too much of that way then and for a festival to come back it, it, it takes months and months and months because you need at least at least a four month period, more like five, of seeing ticket sales right. before you can know you can have that a festival and pay these musicians. And that five, four or five months doesn't start until public perception of the vaccine is, yeah, it seems to be working. I think it's going to work. We're good. And that only happens after a month of it getting out to people and having it. And another month before, you know, when we get it. So you're talking six, seven months from the day we get the vaccine that festivals can even begin yeah. to start. So, so we're talking July, maybe next even year. August of yeah. next year before the gigs I usually play will come back. Right. Uh, and, and the thing is, yeah, people felt bad for musicians at the beginning. But then as life gets more and more back to normal, they're eventually going to say, well, yeah, things are back to normal for you too, right, Corey? I'm like, I don't have a gig for another eight months. So people are going to yeah. be like, what do you mean? They don't understand. You can't have a festival until you see money coming in. from t- And people have to feel comfortable by flights, by hotels, and buy tickets to these festivals. Yeah. And, and that's going to be a long time. So <laughs> that's yeah, the worry. No. It's... It's crazy. I uh, I hope things all work out for all of us. Uh, I was going to ask too: Is music your only gig, or you do something? It it is. That is uh, that has always been what I do. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, I yeah. Uh, I, music is the only thing for me now. It wasn't last year. Uh, you I, are music as your science. I, yes, I uh, I became a promoter. Uh, on top of being a musician, so, so you're was, you're a young Ron Onesti. Then. I, I I don't know about that, but uh, I was booking shows here in Rockford, and I did my. You played at our festival last year, Solo Italiano, and uh, mm-hmm. so picked the wrong year to do all that. But what are you going to do? So uh, I know you said uh, I think before the interview uh, you don't have a CD. Is that right? Uh, no, 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 I do. Oh, okay, do. you do? Okay. Um, I have I have two. I should oh, okay. Come out before the end, I'll, uh, I'll show yeah, you. Yeah, but, yeah, that's where we're getting at now, so how can, <laughs> what, uh, what can people do to find you? What CDs do you have? All that good stuff. Right. Um, so th- what's funny is um, the one I made with this violinist I play with, who's also a world champion in Boston, um, she, but we, we kind of, I don't know, we were doing the CD for a while, recording it, because we both had our own careers and everything. We finally got it. We said, all right, let's have it come out in January of 2020. So the whole year in 2020, all the festivals we're going to do, you know, each of us in our own career, in case we do together, we're going to say, this is a brand new CD, brand new 2020. Well, that went out the window. <laughs> yeah. So now next year in, into 2022, we're going to say, this is a brand new CD, brand new 
from 2020. <laughs> that was never used. So th this is one. It's called uh, Undisputed. Okay. The camera. But that it's all on um, on uh, what do you call it? Uh, my website, CoreyPistero.com or CPezMusic.com. Uh, either or, they go to the same website. And the other is a jazz one I did uh, with people at Arano's actually in Michigan uh, called this is Outrospectives. It was uh, hmm. it's, this is specifically a jazz one. And you can see these both on, on my website. But um, so the, the world music one on, unscripted is all music from around the world, and uh, Outrospectives is specifically a jazz one. So I have new CDs, but which I never, yeah, I never really do CDs because I made my first CDs uh, when I was what, in college. And uh, at that point, I already knew it was the end of the CD era. I said, these yeah. are basically really nice business cards. That's all they are. Right. But you still need something to sell at festivals because especially a lot of the accordion festivals that I do, they're older people. Right. And they're not going to go on you know, streaming. They just want the CD. And right. I still like it. You know, you've made a product. You spent right. time to make this. I want to hear it. Uh, and, and here it is. I can feel it. I can see it. Read about it. Um, but, you know, I'm old-fashioned. I'd still rather read the newspaper than, you know, <laughs> watch on the television. I'm the same uh, way. So uh, yeah, yeah. so other than that, uh, is there anything else upcoming for you uh, with all this revolutionizing the accordion? You got any other, you know, videos well, or specials or things uh, you're doing? Yeah, there's always, yeah, if you want to see stuff that I'm doing, for sure, you know, both on my the, the Facebook page, Corey Pesaturo, uh, and Instagram, CPEZ, as you said. Uh, that I guess my camera is called CPES as well. <laughs> um, you know that that's where I constantly am, am. You know, updating and posting things that that would make people go, "Oh wow, I didn't know the recording could do that." I just posted something this week um, of of Jacob Collier's Flintstones, which was one of that. the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Hmm. Um, many things I do that seem incredibly difficult to me are not. They're like, yeah, but I mean, I know what I'm doing, and you know, it's it's like, how do you fly this plane? Ah, you know what you're doing. It's easy, but. That was stupid hard. Um, and, and I'd always recommend people to see the actual Jacob Collier version and then see what, you know, me playing all the voices together. Um, but, you know, stuff like that. I'm always trying to, to just push the envelope of, of what's possible with the accordion. And there is so much that is possible with the accordion. And it's such an Italian instrument. Uh, as I yep. said, most of the accordions that exist on this planet were built in one town in Italy. Uh, and all the all the Italian Americans in America that made the accordion so popular, um, so it's it's tied there. And it's funny always being the only accordionist at these at these Italian festivals. So of course, as you can imagine, yeah. at, at the you know from midnight to four in the morning every night at these festivals, it's I'm the only instrumentalist, or maybe there's a mandolin player, and I got to know all the tunes, <laughs> and I'm playing for all these singers. You know how singers are. They got to outdo each other. Oh, no, I, I want to sing this. Oh, no, no, wait, I'll watch this one. No, no. But they have to come over to me, and it's almost like they need to pay me. It's like, right, can, you, can you do La Danza, but in G minor? But La Danza. Uh, okay, okay. And then you good, good, good. And so I'm just like, you know, I got to play all these tunes. But it's kind of fun because I'm, you know, I'm directing the, the whole thing basically by being the one playing. And Aaron with, the, you know, his personality. Is oh, yeah. Much half directing it. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, but, but it's fun being, you know, the, all these Italian festivals in the United States of America. And I'm the instrumentalist that runs around people's stages and plays with everybody. Uh, and plays at the, the fun, post though. events, and yeah, I mean, it's 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 its own little world, but it's a very very fun world. Yeah, no, uh, and I wish I invite more people <laughs> <laughs> to come, even if you're not Italian. As I said earlier, as long as you you understand and know the yeah. Italian music, we're more than happy to bring you into the family. <laughs> so one last quick question. Um, for people like me that uh, might see what you do and think, I've always wanted to play that, but. I, I never have, and maybe I could, you know, especially now with COVID, we're all stuck home. Uh, you know, I'm a musician. I know how to read, write music, but I'm a guitar player and a drummer and not a piano player. I've never used both my hands. <laughs> is, there, <laughs> is there hope for, like, a guitar player to pick up the accordion one day, or is it going to be more difficult for people like us that, you know, we're not using both sides? One, one hand's just strumming. So... Mm. Uh, this is the difficulty of the accordion. Uh, and more again, I keep, I keep going back to modern culture, but it's just it's a really important aspect of all these things we've talked about. Um, the accordion is not an instant gratification instrument. It, like the violin, takes years and years to sound remotely good. Uh, because with the guitar or the piano, as soon as you hit a note or pluck a note, it sounds good. It, just, it sounds good. It's a nice, clean ping or... Ding. Mm -hmm. 
the accordion or something like a string instrument, until you get the bellows right and until you have a clean technique of going dun, 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 dun so it sounds so bad. <laughs> Uh, so it, it takes dedication. When you start playing accordion, you can't say, yeah, I'm going to you know, learn accordion. No, 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 no. You need to say from day one before you touch it, I want to learn this. I want to actually play this and learn it because it's going to take years before it sounds good. Um, and, and that's really tough to sell in today's world where you, know, you want to be able to just you pick up an instrument and within a couple hours play a tune for people. Yeah. That's not going to happen with the accordion at all. Um, and it's a big, heavy instrument. You know, <laughs> so yeah. it's not you can't jump around on stage like Mick <laughs> Jagger. It's it's a 25 pound instrument. Uh, so it's 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 got its issues. But if you are dedicated to it, yes. Um, and the so fact that you learn the piano. Right. So you get a free free right. instrument. If you call now, you get one instrument free. And so if you already know piano, you've got that. And, and the thing is, the left hand of the accordion teaches music theory better than any system that's ever been developed in human history. Hmm. You will learn music theory so well with the left hand of the accordion. Um, whether it, the, the line of fourths and fifths, which is the basis of all Western music, and also on the other line is major minor seven diminished chords, which every advanced chord ever by Stravinsky or the great jazz players was always either a major minor seven or diminished chord, no matter how advanced it is. So you learn all the foundations of music in the left hand of the accordion. <laughs> while you learn what most people would say is the best way, way to learn music theory is a piano. Well, right. you got both. <laughs> you, and you have phrasing. That's with interesting. The so you have everything there. Uh, it's just you have to really want to do it. It's not an instrument you can just pick up and say, I want to learn a couple songs on. It doesn't work like that. Well, then there's no hope for me. I'll stick to the guitar. <laughs> 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 I've, I've tried long enough for the guitar, and I've, I'm good enough at that, so I think I'll at stick to it. And, and, and see, that system I can't understand. Like, wait a minute. On this string, I have these notes, but then if I want this note, I have to go to the next string, and then I pluck and hold a finger down. Like, that mentality to me is... It's, been, it's amazing to think, but it's been 20 years for me on the guitar mm-hmm. now, and it's, it's interesting. I learn things all the time, and so it's, I love the guitar. It's, it's all shapes, which I'm very visual when I play, so maybe yeah. it would work. You know, how I think of chords is, is the visual of what it looks like, so it would kind of be the same yeah. on the left hand. But, uh, well, anyways, I appreciate you coming on today, uh, talking to us. Uh, you know, we should have another just accordion talk one day. Maybe I can try to call. Maybe we can get Michael Angie on here. That'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he knows how to do Zoom and all that, uh, but that'd be, that'd be pretty cool because uh, there's, fam- <laughs> <laughs> there's a family connection with me and him. So that's, that's kind of cool. So, um, but I, I appreciate it. I'll put all the links to your sites in this. And uh, thanks again for coming on. And let's keep in touch. Grazie mille, Vincent, uh, and arrivederla. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Italian-American Entertainment Podcast.